Recently, Kennedy Hall and Taylor Marshall were discussing the legend of St. George the Dragon Slayer. And at one point, Hall claimed that medieval depictions of dragons were actually depictions of dinosaurs that survived Noah's flood. Other young earth creationists also claim to have evidence of dinosaurs living among human beings quite recently that allegedly disproves evolution. And today I'm going to talk about why that's a bad argument that Catholics shouldn't use because of the harm it can cause. First, I want to address something Hall and Marshall said about Catholic answers and the theory of evolution. If I were on a Catholic answers thing and I was like, hmm, you know, let's question infant baptism. And like, yo, let's talk about that, you know, or let's talk about, you know. But if you say, if you come in and you're like, theistic evolution is false, like they get kind of dogmatic about it. Yeah. Now, if Marshall just said evolution is false, we wouldn't be dogmatic about it. Some Catholic Answers staff members might agree with him and others might disagree. But if he said the church teaches theistic evolution is false, then I will be very dogmatic because that's not what the church teaches. I want to make it clear that the Catholic Church does not have a teaching about the theory of evolution or the extinction of the dinosaurs. You can be a faithful Catholic and deny or accept the theory of evolution. You can be a faithful Catholic and believe the sun revolves around the earth. The church doesn't teach on these scientific questions. Now, Hall does say he does not want to dogmatize young earth creationism, and I appreciate him saying that. He just asks that people like me not use evolution to evangelize. No, you cannot evangelize with evolution. Evangelism means to share the good news of salvation in Christ. And part of that good news is that a loving God made the world. And we can use things the church does not teach to show that's true. For example, the church doesn't teach that atomic theory is true and that the universe is composed of four fundamental forces that are finely tuned for our existence. But this can be really helpful in proving the gospel truth that God made the world to prove it to an atheist, even though the church doesn't have a teaching on this. Paul may be referring to this article by chemist Stacy Tresenkos, where she explains what she means by evangelizing through evolution. She writes, we should be evangelizing through science, showing others how the ubiquitous order and beauty in creation, from electron orbitals to human life to cosmic galaxies, enriches faith and points beyond the physical realm. Also, if Hall wants Catholics to not use evolution to try and prove Catholicism is true, I would just ask him to reciprocate. Don't use bad young earth creationist arguments to try and prove Catholicism is true. Now, this isn't anything I have personal against him or anyone else. This is just something I see among many more Catholics using these kinds of arguments. And it's concerning because you don't need those arguments to prove Catholicism to a Protestant or an Eastern Orthodox young earth creationist because those people already believe in a young earth. It's other doctrines like the papacy that are the major stumbling blocks for them. But in using these arguments with non-religious people, you create stumbling blocks for those who lack an encounter with Christ, the people who truly need the gospel. This is especially true if you try to convince someone to abandon atheism by saying evolution must be false because we know dinosaurs and human beings lived side by side a few hundred years ago. One way young earth creationists argue for this is by pointing to ancient and medieval depictions of creatures that they say are actually dinosaurs, even though modern people would say they're depictions of dragons. I once saw a Catholic young earth creationist appeal to the supposed dinosaur of Teprom in Northwest Cambodia. One of the reliefs in this Cambodian temple supposedly depicts a stegosaurus that lived among the Cambodians about a thousand years ago. But the only part of the relief that makes this look like a stegosaurus are the alleged flaps on its back. But when you zoom out, you see that these are not flaps. They're decorative petals that can be found throughout the entire relief. If that's what they are, then the creature in question could be an iguana or a rhinoceros because it doesn't have traits unique to Stegosaurus, like tail spikes, and its head is far too small. Or it could be a mythical creature, because at the bottom of the relief, there is a half-monkey, half-dog mythical creature. This image certainly doesn't prove Stegosauruses lived among the Cambodians a thousand years ago, especially since no Stegosaurus fossils have been found in Cambodia. This being a mythical creature also explains images of dragons and other creatures found in ancient and medieval artwork. Consider Kennedy Hall's claim that a medieval Chinese dragon is actually a dinosaur. This is a picture from the 1500s. It's a Chinese picture. 
is it's uh, a Chinese picture uh, of what's a dinosaur. Like this is just a, you know, something that's in the, the yeah. annals of history. This is just one example. It's in the Shanghai Museum. No. And it was painted around 500 years ago during the Ming Dynasty. And it's just clearly, I mean, what does that look like? It clearly looks like something like a dinosaur. I mean, yeah. you know, and China's not a Christian country and never really was. So, I mean, this can't be right. chalked up to fundamentalism. People in the past also made depictions of creatures like the phoenix or the minotaur. But that doesn't mean that phoenixes or minotaurs really existed. Why not think that this image is also of a mythical creature? The source Hall used for the alleged Chinese dinosaur is an article at the Colby Center entitled Historical Evidence for Dinosaur and Human Coexistence. They say it's supposed to be a colophysis, but it barely resembles it. Medieval Chinese artists were able to accurately draw horses, deer, and bears. So why would they give this weird, inaccurate interpretation of a dinosaur? Well, probably because they weren't trying to draw a real animal. In ancient cultures, most mythical creatures are combinations or exaggerations of existing creatures. And that's what we see here. One of the other examples the article gives is Bishop Bell's Behemoths. It says the following. This brass engraving was made over 500 years ago and decorates Bishop Bell's tomb in England. The two animals depicted are very unambiguous sauropods, but were probably known to the locals of the time as dragons. The animal on the left has a tail that ends in a spiked club, just like the sauropod Shonosaurus. It's fascinating to consider that these dinosaurs were probably roaming the hillsides of medieval England. First, this looks like two lions or cats fighting. But even if you don't know what these creatures were supposed to be, since they could also just be mythical creatures, we can know what they're not, and they're not giant sauropods. For example, Cetiosaurus, a sauropod whose fossil was found in England, was almost 50 feet long. If these creatures lived in England until the time of Martin Luther, why didn't anyone write about them? For example, wolves went extinct in England in the 1700s due to overhunting, and before that they were frequently discussed in medieval literature. One 10th century Anglo-Saxon king demanded tribute be paid to him in 300 wolf skins. And a medieval text called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes how January was called Wolf Monath, the official month of wolf hunting. And don't be shocked, but absolutely none of these texts describe people hunting giant sauropods that were twice as big as a London double-decker bus. However, Hugh Owen, the director of the Colby Center, which is committed to promoting young earth creationism, says these historical sources do describe dinosaurs in medieval England. He cites the creature Grendel in the 10th century English epic poem Beowulf as an example. Those dinosaurs that could survive the harsh environmental conditions and were any kind of a threat to human beings or livestock were, were hunted down. And uh, if you've read the poem Beowulf, Grendel perfectly matches the description of some kind of T-Rex dinosaur. In fact, Beowulf kills Grendel because he's able to get in close to her and rip one of her little arms out of its socket so that she bleeds to death. Hmm. And these are not fantasies. Beowulf is talking about historical people. And all over the world, we find... Very accurate drawings, sculptures, mosaics, cave paintings of all different kinds of dinosaurs. Okay. First, Grendel is a male, not a female. And Beowulf rips out his arm and kills him before killing Grendel's mother with a sword. Second, it's silly to say that this means Grendel was a T-Rex with stubby arms and a human being really killed a Tyrannosaurus rex in this way. The idea that Grendel was a Tyrannosaurus rex attacking 7th century Danish people in real life comes from creationist Bill Cooper's book, After the Flood. The problem is that, contra Owen and Cooper, Grendel is not specifically described in Beowulf. Grendel is said to be a descendant of Cain, and that he is larger than any other man, and Grendel's mother is said to be in the form of a woman. They're probably some kind of hominid or human-like monster. They definitely were not a pair of T-Rexes. Other evidence young earth Catholics present for human dinosaur coexistence isn't as obviously false as a medieval British brontosaurus or T-Rex, but it's still faulty. 
At this 2024 Colby Center conference, a speaker listed as Dr. Kevin Mark gives evidence for dinosaurs and humans coexisting by citing the Paluxy River tracks, which claim to be fossilized footprints of a human and a dinosaur next to each other. Um, if it wasn't enough seeing a human footprint or handprint in Cretaceous rock, 100 million years old or 120 million years old, having it right beside a dinosaur print is very difficult to explain. But scientists have now shown that the alleged human footprints at the Paluxy tracks only look human because of erosion. This evidence for human dinosaur coexistence is so bad that even other young Earth creationists have rejected it. Answers in Genesis lists it under evidences to be avoided. And back in 1986, John Morris, the son of Henry Morris, one of the founders of modern young Earth creationism, said... It would now be improper for creationists to continue to use the Paluxy data as evidence against evolution. So what does this all mean? If you want to believe that the Earth is only thousands of years old and humans coexisted with dinosaurs even just a few hundred years ago, you're free to believe that. If you are not Catholic and you're also firmly convinced of this, you can keep believing that if you become Catholic, which I hope you do become Catholic. You could also believe a more defensible claim that dinosaurs didn't go extinct a few hundred years ago, but were wiped out right after they got off Noah's Ark. But I do strongly caution you to not make the claim that evolution is false because T-Rexes lived in medieval Denmark or Brontosauruses lived in Reformation era England as an apologetic argument for the faith. At best, this will only reassure other young earth Christians who don't need to be convinced God exists, and it will alienate people who think religion is an uncritical fairy tale. St. Augustine dealt with a similar controversy in his own time when debating pagan philosophers. Here's what he said. It often happens that even a non-Christian knows a thing or two about the earth, the sky, the various elements of the world, about the movement and revolution of the stars, and even their size and distance, about the nature of animals, shrubs, rocks, and the like and maintains this knowledge with sure reason and experience. It is offensive and ruinous, something to be avoided at all cost, for a non-believer to hear a Christian talking about these things as though with Christian writings as his source, and yet so nonsensically, and with such obvious error that the non-believer can hardly keep from laughing. The trouble is not so much that the erring fellow is laughed at, but that our authors are believed by outsiders to have held those same opinions and so are despised and rejected as untutored men to the great loss of those for whose salvation we toil. How are they going to believe our books concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven when they think that they are filled with fallacious writing about things which they know from experience or sure calculation? I hope this has been helpful for you all, and if you'd like a traditional perspective on this issue, I'd recommend Father Paul Robinson's interview on the SXPX podcast, as well as his book, The Realist Guide to Religion and Science, both of which are listed in the description below. Thank you all so much, and I hope you have a very blessed day.